happy to see you again. Oh my god, you have no idea. What have you been up to? Well, I've been watching movies. W what movies? You know, I just saw Belly last night. Oh, really? Was that 35 millimeter? 17th time seeing it? Well, I don't even know how many times <laughs> I've seen it, but I saw it in the theater. Had you, you'd done that before? Oh yeah, 98, made my dad take me. How was it? It was incredible. Did you cry? Is there crying? There's no crying in Belly. It's weird if you cry in Belly. Yeah. Uh, but there was just a lot of like elation, just me sitting there. Uh, eating bunch of crunch, just taking it in. Hype Williams, one movie. The only one? Only one. Did I, oh uh, what? Not one to know, I was gonna say, who we have today. Okay, yes. the guest today. One of my favorite musicians of all time. Hamilton Lighthouser, he was a singer. Wait, the Walkman? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, fun facts, which I'll bring up with him momentarily. Please. Before their record ever came out, they came and played the shitty basement of my shitty house when I was in college. No. Yeah, yeah, my band opened. And then they played, I have a recording of it somewhere. And um, yeah, we, we partied all night, it was wonderful. Also I had a band before the Walkman called the Recoys. They were pretty cool. The Recoys? Recoys, like decoys with an R. Yeah. Oh, is that an actual word? No. Oh. Uh, don't think so. Maybe, okay. I doubt it. Um, the other guest is uh, Neve Shulman. Oh, catfish. Yep, fellow native New Yorker. Oh, we love this. Yeah. This so, is awesome. Endless topics you can do with him. Endless topics. Yeah. No shortage of things to talk about. Oh, oh my God. His travels. His <sighs> His growing fame, which started in the funniest way. So, yeah. I don't York, even know that now. I can't wait to hear that. Oh, it's going to be great. This is exciting. There's only one thing that I need before I go and talk with them. <sighs> it's like, a, I'll get to start, I would like two night times. Oh, we love that. Yeah, the illegal uh, nice. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you didn't even want to talk to me, you just wanted those drinks. No, I love you and I, I wanted just... to talk to you. This is the thing, I just had to do this, you know? Yeah, the illegal so I good. have to drink. You have to drink. Everybody should drink, this is great. <laughs> safely though. Responsibly. Yeah, responsibly and safely. But we're, we're not, you can just skip drinking, come on. There you go, just be a safe person. Yeah, just you know, err on the side of caution. We love that. There you go. Thank you. Enjoy yourself. Oh, I will. <laughs> Oh, hi, Hamilton. Yeah. Thanks. Cheers. Cheers. Ah, I spill it just about every time. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. I know off the bat the first thing I wanted to talk about. He's a coaster. The first time that uh, we like met, correct me if I'm wrong, I called you when you were working at the Met, and I was in my shitty college house, and we were both, you picked up, I was like, are you? And you said Wait, yes. You had my extension. I don't know. How, something happened. Two five eight zero. Yeah, but did you have it listed on a, the like early Walkman site? I or something? probably did because I was building the Walkman well, website from my office. I probably put my office yeah. or something. And you picked up, and we talked for five seconds, and you went, "Are we both listening to?" And we both had Exile on Main Street playing. Really? Yeah. I have no memory <laughs> of that. I'm sorry. That's stuck in my craw. But that sounds. Uh, that's incredible. It could that's be apocryphal, but I think that happened. Yeah. yeah. And no, but I do remember playing at your house at Tufts. That's the I'm, one I'm talking about, yeah. Right, right, yeah, yeah. Which was fun, right? That, was that, I remember was it being, those are the glory days. Those are great shows. One of my favorite memories that night was um, <laughs> trying to help you. <laughs> it was like a traveling circus trying to get the piano. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Loaded out, which I think was your life for like a decade. That was my life for a decade. Like, Pianos, up the steps. Yeah, in and out like of joking bands. with you and thanking you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. We dropped a lot of pianos in our time. <laughs> you guys didn't we did. care. It was we like, didn't oh. care. There was one, but actually, no, I just remembered. There's a point where you're moving up the stairs, and one of you, it might have been you, was like, fuck it, just drop it. <laughs> like, just let it go. That is like one out of 50 or 60 times we did okay, that. Good, good. Yeah. Yeah, we dropped one through a wall in London one time <laughs> at the place called The Bar Fly, which anybody who's done any time in any shitty rock club in London knows that place right down the stairs, right through the wall. And then we dropped one in uh, Birmingham, coming out of the Birmingham Academy. And uh, it was on wheels. And uh, so we just like, we were, it was sort of late night and everybody was having a drink and nobody was paying attention. And the thing went right off the high curb. And it was a full size upright. And when it hit the ground, I swear to God, it was like a mushroom cloud. Like it exploded. Like it was like the loudest and biggest explosion I've ever been a part of in my and life. And how much more tour did you have? And we left it there on the street. Did you? No piano the rest of the tour? I think maybe that was the last show. I don't remember that part of it. All I remember is that is just screaming and laughing and leaving the piano on the street. The real question I want to ask <laughs> is, is that this. is that uh, I was about to ask you about all these other shows, and I really was thinking that knowing you were going to be on, 
I was curious, like one to ten, how psychotic it is to have, I don't know, me in the front screaming drunk every show. There's always people drunk screaming. Okay, okay. So I didn't, it wasn't like, I wasn't like yeah. a bad anomaly. No, I mean, you play like Manchester, you get those <laughs> lads with the shaved heads singing the rat in the front row, I and mean, those are the guys you gotta watch Sorry. out for. Yeah, they'll be waiting for you after the show, just jacked up, like, you know. Yeah. That, that does get a little. Wait, uh, I dicey. wanted to ask you, um, I was just telling you before, Martin Rev from Suicide was on the show. Right. He was talking about, he said something that reminded me of you, and I wanted to double check if I was right. He said, that the first time he met Rick Ocasek, who produced a bunch of the records, right. was backstage at the Rat, the club in Boston. Oh, yeah, yeah. I played Did one you? of the last shows ever in that place. I feel like you talked about, is it tied to the song at all? Is it, is that no, about, it has nothing that's to do with the not. Club, it's, right? that, the okay. name The Rat, the song, comes from a nickname of a friend. Okay. Um, but no, I, I, the Recoys, my old band, was one of the final probably five bands as that club petered out. It wasn't like a glorious ending. It was, it was like, like playing, uh, it's like when my band well, played CBGB's yeah, we like played, 20 years Exactly, too we had played CBGB's too. We were there right at the end. Really weird. Yeah, yeah. it wasn't, there was no <laughs> like charm Doing the victory left. lap, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did meet Rick Ocasek once, though, and thought he was just the coolest guy. He was an A&R guy for Electro Records, and they wanted to sign us. Ooh, and we what, went... Between records or before? No, at the beginning. Okay. And uh, we went to his office, which is at, like, Rockefeller Center. And he was so cool. And we, all, we had already almost inked our deal with Warner Brothers, but every single person in our band was like, we want, it, we want that guy. Yeah. We want to be yeah. with that guy. But they're like, I don't know, business people weren't really into us, so they weren't really going to offer us very much. So he didn't want to, did you like want to produce? Uh, I don't remember the discussion. I just remember being kind of like smitten, like thinking he was such a cool dude. Yeah, my wife growing up, he was her neighbor. Really? She has a story that uh, could be apocryphal, but it sounds true to me, that she was blasting the cars one day, forgetting he was the neighbor, and he craned his neck out the window and said, turn down that garbage. Really? <laughs> What True, neighborhood right. is that? That's Boston? Through no, in New York. Oh, it's in New York. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> Through pebbles at the window, yeah, romantically. Lately, I've been listening a lot, obviously, to your solo records. And something I obviously. was bugging you about before was, like, in seeing you play this music live, it obviously sounds like you. There's obviously, like, sonic connection to the band that you were in. But I'm curious how your frame of mind changes, like, approaching that both songwriting-wise and also like stage presence wise. Cause now, like I was saying you before, I went to that, I just caught a show with you and Kevin um, Morby on tour. And I think that and the shows at the Carlisle, you're actually like letting listeners behind the curtain of like, hey, this song is about this like crazy moment that happened at a wedding and this guy right. was wasted, right? Was that a concerted effort to realize that this time I, I want to let people in on the process more? Yeah, it was. I mean, it was, it, it, it developed naturally because when we are in the Walkman, we were five-person democracy, and we get up there and we play these loud songs that were really, you know, you, so I felt like you could rely on everybody else to do their part, and now it really is like that, my name's on the bill. When I get up there, I like to, these days when I write a song, I, I kind of want to connect with people in a way that, it used to just be sort of emotion and volume and, and, and you know, rock, and it was really fun, and I, I I still try to do that in a lot of ways, but but now it's like uh, I find that if I tell people the story that is behind the song, or you know, for instance, the bride's dad is a good example of it. I tell them actually what I'm singing about, and I try to make it as clear as possible. Then I can go into the song. Then it, it makes all the difference in the world. That's why I decided that I'll never play that song again without telling the story. So I've told the story. Wait, why? Because everyone's on the hook the whole time. Because they know what I'm saying. It's not nonsense. Right. Well, and, you're right. Well, it's not like super cryptic otherwise, but this way people no, can really No, it's not, but if I, if I tell them the details and I tell them exactly what I'm saying and they have no idea who I am and I'm opening for the arcade fire or something, there's always people there and a lot of them have no idea who I am and I can t tell them the story and then I can sing the song and then they get the jokes and, and it, you know, it's, it, it just, it, it, it's an entirely different thing. And I do that residency every year at the Carlisle, which the first year I did it was maybe like slightly awkward because it was like kind of a transitional period for me. Like I was playing my rock and roll and they never really have that there. And it was like, it was the only time I ever got heckled there too, which was really <laughs> weird because I think, it, I mean, most of the time I think people just buy a ticket to go 
to the car lot, like they night, just go right? see yeah. the show. And it's like Woody Allen or something, yeah. or like you know, Bobby Isaac Short. Mizrahi. Isaac. Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, so like the first year I did it, I did something like a lot of shows. I did like ten or twelve shows or something like that, and. There, there really weren't people there to see me until like night three or four, and then by the end of it, it was like all for me. But the first couple nights, we had only announced it like a week before. The first couple nights, it really was like people just there to see the show. And I remember this like huge sort of like good old boy guy like eating a steak like right in front of me, and I like finish a song and it's just like completely silent. I can like hear this dude like cutting out his steak and stuff. And I can't remember what he said, but he really like flat out. It wasn't you suck, but it was sort of the the. You know, 65 year old man version of like, come on, what is this crap? <laughs> Something like that. And I was like, Jesus, this happens at the Carla? <laughs> and, uh, but then it was at that point on that I, I realized that I was actually just in this tiny room. Like, it's like the size of this place. Yeah. Tiny yeah. And I'm just with these people and they're having dinner and we're talking and, and I'm, I'm telling them my, I'm not blowing people's heads off at some music festival or something like that. And, and I started thinking that, that was, Actually, a really fun, completely different. That was when I finally felt like I shifted my show into my own thing, and 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 I can separate it from my old band. And so now I can go on the bigger stages and stuff, and sort of take that element there. And that's kind of what that tour was with Kevin. I felt like I had my big band, we played right. big places, and uh, but we were able. But it's you know you can try to create that interview. It's kind of a conversation. But how did you get the idea to do the Carlisle residency? They called me whatever six years ago, or whatever. Really. They were just like, I guess they were like reaching, trying to reach a younger crowd or something. Cool. And it was just like at a time where I was, you know, it just sounded really weird actually. And it sounded fun and. It seemed really intuitive when you, when you, when you announced well, they, it. Well, it was a good match. Whoever came up with it, I think they yeah. maybe knew, this girl Jen, I think she maybe knew what she was doing. But it, it, uh, it worked. It, it, it was, I mean, it was funny. The first time it was mentioned to me, I was like, I never, what am I going to be doing like, you know. Start spreading the news, you know. Like, <laughs> but so I made a real conscious eff effort to play like rock and roll, play like the mummies okay, and like well, the cramps or something. I was, gonna, I was gonna say you know? the inverse thing. Like when I was younger, I remember being in a band, and after the show, one of my bandmates' dads being like, "Listen, great show, but like I really think you're 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 playing drums too loud for the room. You got to play to the room." And right. I was like, "Fuck you!" I was yeah. so pissed off, and it made me more. It's the most immature response. This guy was actually a musician, but I was like, no, my, like, I always well, think about the parts yeah. like, my environment's gotta be a product of me. <laughs> like, you gotta yeah. force it on it. When in reality, weaving in a little bit is not like defeat. Like, no, I mean, well, yeah, I mean, when I was 14 and I was playing my first show, every single knob on my amp was on 10. <laughs> every knob. Yeah. Yeah, it's Even like the channels boss. that weren't on, they're on. Like, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, okay. What about singing? Because do you feel like now the way your songs and melodies are structured, you're like, it feels like you're unlocking new ways of singing that still sound like you. I don't know if it's a byproduct of just not having to match like the five canons right. of the Walkman, but do you feel like the way this music is created is giving you more room to explore with your singing voice? Well, I, I, yeah, I mean, I. Yeah, you're, I'm not writing with. I write. I, we wrote all the Walkman stuff with me, Walt, and Paul, and their big presences, and and you know it sets you in a in a certain frequency. It's kind of weird, but you know Paul's guitar is in a certain frequency, and yeah. when I would sing with that guitar, and you can just listen to our songs. That's you know that's where those come from. So uh, you know when you don't have that, you start in a different place. And and I, I play all my own instruments now on the records, which I really love doing. Uh, and that's something that I got from my friend Rosnam who was the first guy to ever show me how kids, or whatever, people <laughs> younger than me, um, who I guess aren't even kids anymore, um, l like learned how to make music in their dorm rooms when computers became good enough to be able to do it. Like, I'm just a little bit too old to be able, like, yeah, you I always had to have a yeah. studio and a band and all that stuff. Right. So I didn't, understand, I didn't even know how to do that. Uh, but now I guess everybody does that. But uh, I'm one of them. Well, so, but not everybody's playing every instrument on the record. No, not. And, and the other thing is that it's it, it, it's it, one thing that he really showed me that I'd never. I, I you know I always had four tracks and stuff like that. But, but the big thing is is being able to catch, capture the energy onto the recording if you're doing it in that process. Like mm -hmm. you got to do it fast and you got to do it live because you don't have that band. So that that's one of the hard. It's, anybody can turn a drum machine on or hit a synthesizer or or do a click track or something like that. But the whole 
thing is to be able to listen to it back later and realize that it still has some sort of life. I'm curious what your early New York days were like. Like, where were you? Were you in school in Boston and then came down right after that? Yeah, I, I, I was in Boston for two years and then I was uh, at NYU for two years and I lived in the East Village. And we had our band, The Recoys, and we had absolutely zero success, but we slept at, we, we... <laughs> Recoys always also played Tufts once, and I, I remember going... We did? To, but not with Maybe no, with the makeup, do we play with the makeup? I think I remember playing up in that direction with the makeup one time. It was in Which for house. me was like a dream because yeah, that's I was a, a, huge I was deal, a yeah. big Well, you're DC, fan. right? Yeah, DC, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, it was some weird, it was good. It was some like the arts house or something. It was some like, other, some other place, not-, not But that was before out. your time? Yeah, well, no, I was there. Oh. But it wasn't, it was like, I didn't arrange that. I just uh -huh. went, I was like, oh, this is cool. But that band um, had zero success. Yeah, we had, we had zero success, but we tried. We played a show <laughs> at um, Coney Island High, which was on oh, St. Yeah. Mark's Place. Oh, yeah. Which was not a small room. The downstairs was a pretty big room, actually. There's yeah. a small club yeah, yeah, upstairs. Yeah, 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 yeah. And we were playing the downstairs. And uh, we uh, went on stage. And the only people in the entire club were my friend Nick and Josh. Hey. And the bartender was in the back. <laughs> you know them. Yeah. And uh, halfway through the set, we finished the song. Nick was like, hey, him, uh, we got to go. So we'll see you later. <laughs> I was like, thanks, man. All right, thanks for coming. They left, and did we finished the set for the bartender in the back. Did you guys ever have shows like that at the fucking Magic Stick in Detroit, where you go and it's like I've the size there. of a like a like a gladiator arena? No, luckily by the time we got there, we were doing okay. But I have played there. Oh, many we played times. there with no like seven people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but I've I've done that a lot of Jesus times. Yeah, Christ. yeah. That is a real that's a real learning experience. <laughs> yeah, it's I don't know tough. what I'm learning, but yeah. something. You're not learning a lot. Fucking a. But so. Recoys, but how long were you doing recoys in the city before the walk? We had uh, two, I moved here in uh, 98 and uh, so those guys two were still years doing and then bands. right when uh, when I graduated from college, one of the guys in my band was like, I don't wanna do this anymore. And uh, he's the guy who I had to call up to be at the Carlisle last year when my other guy got COVID. Oh, yeah, I was like, I know it's been 20 years, but you gotta learn a couple of <laughs> Yeah, a one, a two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, then at that exact same time, uh, my cousin's band, Jonathan Fireder, was breaking up, and so we, I called him and we figured out that we should try it. And so we started a band right then, and that was 2000. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think that fall, right before your record came out, is when somehow I got hip to it beforehand because I was up to speed and into Jonathan Fireder, and someone had told me that there was this new band percolating. And that's when, I guess it was the fall before the record came out that we were up in Boston for the show. But then, when does that, was does that record come out, 01? It came out later, like we, fin we, we, we put it out ourselves as two vinyl things, and it took a really long time for it to come out. Like, you know, the re whatever the release date is now that would be on Google or whatever is like, is like a year and a half or two years after it really came, after we were manufacturing them ourselves and putting them out, so. I don't actually know, but I, I'd say we, I think we manufactured our first vinyl in the fall of 2000 and we were just like selling it at shows and, yeah, yeah. and we'd go to like other music and give them a bunch and then they'd sell them. Did you, um, this won't entirely be Welcome to Memory Lane, don't worry, I'm just, this is reminding me all this shit. Do you remember, so like from the outside it seems like the rat was this enormous, like it felt like a seismic thing and I wonder if it did within the band too, but I remember when you started playing it before it was out, I think I think I remember being at a show of yours and you said you had a new song. It was called like "Girl Girls at Night" or something. It's like Girls a working at title. Night, I think that's what it was called. And I remember you played it, and I was like, "It's what so the weird." Yeah, I remember this shit. You played it, and I remember the room being like, which never happens with songs people haven't heard before. Right? Could you tell it was a thing? Yeah, you did. Right? Yeah. Um, I guess my last question about that whole era is, how is it to uh, uh, sing with Matt? Uh, playing drums behind you. Matt is an animal. <laughs> he's like one of my favorite drummers I mean, of all time. He's a time. monster. Yeah, it's great. It's, it was some I always, you know, I I was a fan of his band, which would have been Jonathan Fireder, but would have been the Ignobles before that. Since I was, you know, in fourth grade, so yeah. I had been watching uh, them yeah. play all those years, playing and like and playing with Matt was like a dream. <laughs> yeah. Right? yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. Wait, what's the age difference? They're uh, six years, I'm the youngest one in that band. They're between six and five years older than me. And uh, Pete's only a, like a little bit, he's my age. By the way, that was a caveman breakdown. Six years. Oh really? Between me and Matt and Jimmy, and then six years between me and the other guys. 
No shit. Wait, you guys had a 12 year? Yes, dude. Sam. Of course, wow, yeah. <laughs> Damn, that's a big uh... <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty interesting. Yeah. It's interesting being the average age. Right, yeah. Alone, stuck in the middle with me. Yeah. <laughs> um, so then how long has it been now that, when did your first solo record come out now? My first solo record came out in 2014. Holy shit. Yeah, it's been, a, it's been a minute. But I've actually done a lot of stuff. It's just that uh, no, not no. all of it has been branded as like my, uh, you know, just like a, you know, I think that you would think I only have like three or four solo records, but I've actually just been involved in so many projects. Maybe mm. sometimes behind the scenes. Like I did a lot of, uh, well, I did a vinyl only record called Dear God with Paul. Yeah, that, yeah. That, uh, I did uh, the soundtrack for about, 15 or 16 podcasts now that that I didn't know that, about. Yeah, it's it's actually been really fun. Um, thing you know you don't get you're not like credited. You 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 make the it's sort of like a behind the scenes kind of thing. Which I which brought me to the project that I uh, did recently where I scored uh, the last movie stars, which uh, my friend Ethan was making. Oh yeah, how did you do that? And then how do you guys know each other? Uh, I, we met through a mutual friend a long time ago, and. Uh, We've just been friends for a while. And he was uh, approached by Paul Newman's family to make this, and Joanne Woodward's family to make this documentary about them. And uh, he fought the good fight and got me, he <laughs> asked me if I wanted to do it. And then I don't think the studio execs wanted me very much, but he, <laughs> he stood up for me and he, uh, he, he got me the job. And, and uh, it was like a dream job. I, like, you strike me as someone who would be a big fan of his of their work. Oh, yeah, without a doubt. The thing is, I mean, I, I, I knew so little about them before I saw the document. It's funny because, I mean, well, one thing you realize is that Paul Newman is like the American icon. Joanne Woodward, everyone's like, who? Hmm. And you, if you've seen the thing, you realize that she won the Oscar first. Yeah. And she was the sort of serious actor and he was kind of the fluff and he knew it. And he, she, he says that she made, created Paul Newman. She, She's the puppet master who made the American icon. Right. She, it was her. Yeah, yeah, he had this anxiety that he wasn't as serious right. as Brando and those guys. Definitely. Like, I'm just, you know, I don't have that. And her. I mean, and her. yeah, because yeah. she acted with Brando. So it was kind of a definite insecurity there. But then he's like, I look great, you know. <laughs> he does. And there's no stopping that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that was a multi year project, right? That went on for, yeah, I, I, I can't remember. The first time Ethan showed it to me was in the early stages of COVID, so whenever that was, a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, yeah, I ended up doing like 150 minutes of music, which is basically like, you know, five records or something like that. Yeah, it's insane. Not like everything is writing a song for a record, but it's... But some of it feels like, some of it feels like it's, it's more spacious, and some of it feels like it's... There's a like, lot of just like songs, song. yeah. 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 It was a lot of work, but it was like a dream. I did it at my home studio. It was during COVID when nobody where, was touring. Where were you? Where, uh, I feel like I remember seeing you do some performances. Oh, yeah. We moved to my uh, parents have a place out in uh, the Blue Ridge Mountains in Virginia. Oh, wow. Okay, yeah. And uh, it was we really uh, sweet. were <laughs> living out there when, I, when my record, The Loves Your Life, came out. And uh, so all the, I was going to do a huge world tour, and uh, everything was canceled. And... Uh, I was in like a feed shed with my two daughters and my two nieces doing like NPR performances. And they're like jumping like around but hitting their mark. Pitchfork their live performances and stuff like that. That's yeah. so sweet. Um, and actually that ended up being fine. It was one of those things where like everything was canceled. It was so disappointing. The world is sort of falling apart. And then you kind of look at it and you're like, it, it wasn't what I was expecting, but it ended up being a little bit fun. Oh, it came out beautiful. Yeah, it was all right. The... Uh, Video. I was just thinking about when you mentioned the show earlier. The video you made with Ethan Hawke for that record was incredible. At the Carlisle. Nice. Yeah, yeah. That's another song where you preface it with a story, and that does really, that really hooked me in for that. Right, one. yeah. That and was what bullshit, I wanted. Right? All I, the wanted that whole, I wanted that whole record to be like, a, like each song is about an individual person in a very specific situation. Yeah, yeah. and the whole idea about that video was that like, he thinks that I. You're revealing it to What's going to happen when somebody realizes that it's about them? Yeah, you know? And they destroy you. Yeah. <laughs> that was really fun to make. But the premise of that song is so cool for uh, those who may or may not know. It's a song, Here They Come, where it's about a guy who basically is frittering his life away, avoiding his problems by spending his days in a movie theater. And the song is basically like how he maybe has to reckon or avoid with reckoning it when the lights come up, right? Yeah. Am I, am I bastardizing and, that? No, no, that's it. Yeah, yeah. The moment when the lights are coming up and he's deciding whether or not to sneak into another movie or uh, maybe head out to uh, 
face, life's whatever complications he's avoiding. I love that. Uh, what are you working on right now? I have a record that I'm getting pretty happy with, but it's been a sl an unbelievable slog. I finished it <laughs> once, and then I didn't finish. What, what, uh, are you doing a super piecemeal, you mean, or? Yeah, I'm doing. Do you need restrictions, by the way? What's that? Do you need restrictions? I need to like deadlines, end? man. I need some. I need, yeah. I need a lot. Of, I need a boss. That's the problem with this. I like need a modern boss. fluid recording setup. I need a salary. Yeah, I you need, need a salary. Pension, okay, let's get you a job. Benefits. We, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's go back to the Met. <laughs> That's what I need. I need the Met, man. <laughs> How was that job, by the way? Uh, it was. It was great. Uh, I love. I mean, I love my, my friends at the Met. Who were awesome, and uh, I feel like you and they paid I, me. I think. Uh, maybe less than minimum wage. I'm sure. At one point, I remember <laughs> when they announced my raise, the boss called me and she announced my raise, and I was like, oh, I'm so, I can't believe I got a raise, it's amazing. And then I found out later that I was given the legal minimum <laughs> raise. <laughs> it was like, you were like, this it was guy. Like 30 cents a day or something like that. <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, you, all you guys always do the weird, uh, the like, most interesting New York y jobs. I remember hearing that, I remember Matt was working at like the Museum of Sex. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, I was at the Museum of Sex for a long time. Everyone was like, a, was everyone at like a cultural institution? Wall in was at the Cloisters. Yeah. What? Paul was, uh, the, Paul used to, um, <laughs> uh, do be the admissions person at uh, admission buttons at the, at the Met, you know, like so when they used to do the thing where you just like yes. sit there and you could yes. give whatever you want. And one time, uh, Jerry Garcia came up and, and said, Hey, can I get one? And Paul was like, Well, yeah, you have to make a donation. And Jerry Garcia was like, I don't have any money. And Paul's like, No, turn him away. <laughs> he, <turned him. laughs> he doesn't like the Grateful Dead. I don't know, I guess not. <laughs> are you do you listen to a lot of new? Shit, or are you? I do. I always listen to new stuff. Uh, I'm trying to think of what. Recently, I went through the longest phase of like sort of not being able to stand to listen to anything beyond like kind of like abstract classical music. Well, uh, because I think maybe I just I spend so much of my day um, working on my own music that when I get to the time to relax, I just don't want to hear a drum beat or a or a rock and roll. Yeah, I thought you were gonna say ambient music, like like. A... No, I, I, not that much. Just extra, most mostly classical music. Yeah. But then, I, if I if I'm ever in the car driving anywhere, my daughters maybe put on Dua Lipa or like, <laughs> or like Taylor Swift or Can something. Have you like fallen that. for any so of the daughters' like, songs? Oh my god! Like well, now I know all into? the stuff. Like I didn't even like. I'm up on all of it because, like, you know, whatever. What's that guy? Harry Styles. They listen to a lot of Harry Styles. Now. So you actually know what his music sounds like? Yeah, yeah. I think my theory is that no one does. I mean, I would. I know what you're saying you know what because I mean. there's a lot of different. It's a sort of a conglomeration of a lot of styles. And I just nicely done. Thanks. I do feel like I feel like it feels like this phenomenon. Like, it could just be a reflection of me being old. But some guy just played 15 shows at the Garden. I couldn't hum you one. So. Right, I, I could I could tell you the sound, but actually, I, it is funny because I, right? I don't know if I could tell you the name of even the ones that I'm thinking of. Is there are there hooks? Are there choruses that repeat? Like, someone played me a song and it was like this kind yeah, of breezy funny. I can't thing, think and I, yeah, of one. right. Yeah, there's like an easy breezy one that's one of the biggest hits. They it always like, want to put like that on. It sounds like an aha song, by the way. Yeah, it does. It sounds yeah, exact. It sounds right, like uh, "Take on Me." Yes. Which I guess is like a, I on remember purpose. extremely Maybe well. A, uh, yeah, yeah. Devastating notion. The video. Yeah, I mean, I could sing along with. What was what was the stuff that was big for you when you were a kid? Like, were you really into Fugazi and stuff? Were you into like yeah, DC? Yeah, when show? I was in when I was like fifteen. But I was a little bit too young to be there for Bad Brains and and Fugazi and, and like Repeater. But right I remember when Re when Repeater came out, I, there was like you know posters everywhere in DC, and that was the first time I was like, who's this band? This but I was I was young. Yeah. But then, so then when I got a little bit older and Fugazi was kind of like on their way out, but they would still play. I would go to their shows and it was $5 and it was all ages. So that was like, that was awesome. But yeah, I went to the second makeup show ever. And so I became oh. obsessed with that. And the Nation of the that was one of my... I, I used to I was, see the makeup play all the time, yeah. Yeah, Walking me too. I, the hands. I saw them all the time. That was like a standard thing he did, right? Do what? Or was it just a show I saw? Oh, yeah, yeah, walking In the Middle out. East, because you can you get to hold the yeah, scene yeah, yeah. mostly. Yeah, the black cat, yeah, same Dude, thing. Walking, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What yeah, they were my jam. Yeah, I, I really, I saw them a million times. From both the Walkman and your solo stuff, I picked you being really into like Roy Orbison and like yeah, early Elvis. Yeah, well, of did, course. Didn't you do Sun Recordings? Rock, we, we did, we did a session down there, which is oh incredibly fun. I mean, you're in the room, which they have like a star on the floor, which is where Elvis used to sing. Which is, is that really, where you sang? Uh, yeah, I think so. I can't remember. But we had, uh, we used to, because we were cheap, we would go on tour and we would have horn sections, but we would just hire people off Craigslist. 
Um, and like 50% of the time they would show up for the paycheck and like couldn't play. Like if, I, if they can play the trumpet, like I can play the trumpet. In Memphis, this guy responded who was, uh, turned out to be this really cool old dude who came in this like maroon, uh, I think it's like a Cadillac. And uh, he, it turned out to be uh, Ben Colley who was in the band The Barcays. And oh, he whoa. happened to be the dude who was strapped back to back with Otis Redding when their plane went down into the lake. and. Every single person on the plane died except for Ben Colley and the pilot. And he's, we were eating pizza backstage and he was sort of like going into that story and everyone was like, wait. Holy what? shit. And then he was answering Craigslist and then, oh yeah. ads in Memphis. And he played with you? And he played with us. He's on the Sun Sessions video. You can see it. It's like all of us and a couple like, you know, 28 year old dudes and Ben Colley. Holy hell. Yeah, it's cool. That was definitely the coolest response we ever had. We had a lot of not cool responses. Do you have any, is it all sweet relief not having to navigate everything that being in a gang of abandoned tales? Or are there any like, basically is your relationship to having been in a band like that the same as like one's relationship to youth where it's like when I think about my 20s, I miss them a lot but I don't want to relive them. Right, I, I, it, it's, a, a band is a, is, a, is a weird entity because you know, however you're going to structure the power is going to be... Contentious. Yeah, you know, I mean, yeah. five guys in a van is just weird, right? <laughs> oh, it's just yeah. for that many hours. You just, like, take a vote about what sandwich That stopped. many yeah. three in the morning <laughs> moments, that many overnight flights, that many Even now it sounds hours in the van. Room. I know, I know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, just, it does sound sort of good. Right? Couple, it's couple like of so, those. Yeah, yeah, we're getting um, excited. But, yeah, so you, but, so, you know, not having to deal with... And, you know, once everybody gets older and, and has kids and things like that, schedules can just become like just such a joke. And everybody, our band moved around the country and stuff, so to get together for band practice was like a flight or something, or like a long drive or something like that. So that just became, you know, sort of like an email relationship, which was just weird, because we used to all just, you know, it, originally what you really get nostalgic for is that like after work, like, we couldn't be there till 7 p.m., but we all like show our up. saving grace we from eat, the day. Yeah, we man. order China Place, and we all have, like, China Place in the hallway, and then we... Where uh, is that, by the way? China Place? No, well, that too, but where, where are you playing? <laughs> it's great. I hope it's still there. Are you... Candy are, chicken. Are you doing... Is that when you had Marcotta? Is that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is the studio that the Walkman had in... Uh, Harlem. There was nothing there except for China Place and KFC Taco Bell. Those, those are the two options. If I cut you off, you'd eat China Place and then go play in Marcotta. Yeah, those, those those fun times. But unsustainable, I guess. Yeah. It's good. I'm glad that you confirmed that you're going to play the fifth anniversary of Nighttime. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Talking with you is a true delight. But wouldn't it be cool if maybe you could play a song? You know, it is funny that you mentioned that, Stefan, because uh, I did bring a guitar and uh, a guy who plays the fiddle here. So. Uh, We're going to do uh, my song, uh, Heartstruck, parentheses, Wild Hunger, because that's the hook. So I had to have that in the title. <clears throat> All right. I never, ever play this song, so you got to excuse me if I fuck it up. All right, ready? One, two, three, one. Kept haunting me 
get me hoping with the thousand black scuff marks my heart Gonna cap your night All the words from All your songs Don't reach me now Cause I swore them all But they're calling out And they keep me Thank you so much. That was incredible. Thank you for having me, man. My pleasure. Now that I have you here, uh, I've got a guy here that I feel like you should meet. Maybe he can come <laughs> join us and talk. You brought a guy show. too? I brought a guy. I, I think he brought a fiddle. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Hey. How does he come over? Yeah, I guess I just know that that's me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that, <laughs> that's Neve. That's hey. Hamilton. How are you doing, Neve? Pleasure. It's nice to meet you. We this is uh, great. For you. Yeah. Ooh. Ooh. A surprisingly un. Uh, it's a thin, it's a thin yeah. cushion. My concern with this setup is that it's like the job interview thing, where I'm oh, like, hey, nice to see you. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're, the, you're I don't mean, I don't like to have a domineering right. uh, presence, but I'm trying. I it's your show. So yes, it's my show, right? Mm -hmm. the sh now the show actually says Stefan's Nighttime at Race. So I was thinking about this, the idea of performance of self. In theory, I'm trying to be myself right now. Mm -hmm. But once cameras are around, all this stuff, I, I wonder how to do it. You always seem shockingly forever. You seem very, what I perceive to be yourself on camera. Is it a lie? Like, has it always felt that way? Have you always felt so comfortable? Did the movie make that happen? Sure, yeah, yeah. I, I, first of all, I liked your music. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thanks very much. Um, how long have you been playing? Dodging. Uh, Dodging. 40 years. 40 years. Yeah. Wait, when did you start? Well, I took piano lessons when I was in like first grade. There you go. No, join the club, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> but did you stay playing piano? No, I quit because uh, uh, it came down to my mom taking away my Sega Genesis, or mm. and you know it got to that. <laughs> you chose Genesis. And I remember crying. I was such a little baby about it. <laughs> I think I allowed the Sega Genesis to be taken away, oh. and I stopped taking piano lessons. So that's a good example mm. of one technique. I've picked up, which is just to ask people questions about themselves, because it really endears them to you in a way and makes them feel more comfortable. I'm not not to say that I wasn't I'm actually interested. Would you mind handing me my cocktail? Yeah, please. <laughs> this, this <is> <laughs> um, no, but see, I I definitely feel like what I do on catfish is a learned skill. Um, I, I've certainly improved over the years. I've always been comfortable on camera. Why? Usually, why? Yeah, like uh, since when? I guess it started when my brother and I started our uh, bar mitzvah wedding videography company. Come again? What so was it called? It was called, well, initially, 
briefly, it was called Skeleton Key Films. I feel like I'd be worried as a parent to hire that. Well, the idea was like we can kind of do anything. Like a skeleton key can kind of unlock any door. I was, no, it was, I know, but also like find all your dirty secrets. It wasn't yeah. working. We changed it to Right Mind Films. Yeah, more like creative. wellness. Okay, good. Yeah. Anyway, still have it. Still technically the president and CEO of Right Mind Films. It's, it's my uh, <laughs> what is it called? Your your it's loan called, oh, out. Yeah. My loan out. Mm. You know, like my my ink, whatever. That's right. where I get paid and yeah. everything. And not just a president, my also tax a member. Guy yeah. kind of you know does what he does. But um, what I've learned is about myself in regards to your yeah, question yeah, yeah, yeah. is there is something about me that does change when the cameras are rolling, but it's primarily that I'm more focused on listening. So it doesn't, I don't change how I act and the things I say and I have lots of dumb dad jokes and I'm like happy to be dumb, do whatever I do. But I know that I also have to really listen way more and focus and like pay attention so that I can hear what people are saying, interpret, you know, hopefully draw some kind of conclusions that might be helpful, but also push them a little bit to be more open and honest and, and vulnerable. So that that's a technique that takes a little bit of time and there's some simple skills and tactics that you can kind of learn to, to get better at it. But did you intuit all these things through reps, or is this something that you actually? I did. Like, I, I have one, there's one thing I learned at Sarah Lawrence College, um, educationally, and it was because I took one film class, film production class. I'm blanking on the teacher's name. She was very interesting, and, and I'm glad I had her. Uh, and she she taught me about awkward silence, as an interviewer, not being afraid of long, long silences, whether you've asked a question or not, waiting, way past what feels like the appropriate amount of time, because normally in conversations we automatically wait till the person's done talking and we have something teed up to say, and then there's never silence, and when there is, it's always immediately like, oops, awkward silence, ha ha ha, ha right, but yeah. real awkward silence, I'm talking like 30 seconds minimum. Oh, we're not going to do that on this show. Well, no, good. But <laughs> that's when a person feels this strange, like almost instinctual, carnal need oh, yeah. we to always say something. About, yeah. right. It's the worst when people do this to me. I hate that shit. Well, I'm not doing it to you I know now, you're not, but right I'm now. saying they wait for, like, right. the pause is... People will fill in that silence eventually. But if they don't, they force you to do it. And no, but then you I'm start saying, digging. But that's what I'm saying. I know. If you if you have the courage to not feel the pressure to fill it in yourself, eventually it kind of goes back to them. And they and they then have to dig deeper and come up with something. Anyway, that's something. We can cut all that. I don't know, I thought it should be silent for a while. I couldn't think of anything else to say. But I was talking to you about this before. Like, I was asking Hamilton earlier about the evolution of, oh, I don't know, his presentation as a performer when he was the front man of, you know, what I think of as like a gang, all weapons firing. Then he goes from a band, like old friends, all thick as thieves, to my mind, and then it's just him on the hook. It's just his name on the right. bill. How does that presentation happen? Is that more yourself, or is it just a different version? Different version, I guess. It's what I want to do now. Yeah. Uh, right now? No. No. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> when I was younger, we used to come out there and we'd not say a word, you know, play yeah. 10 songs as loud as you can. Yeah. Then just leave, then stomp off. No, yeah, no window. All iconic state, you know what I mean? You're just shooting for that. Right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's... dude. Yeah. You're wearing, can I see? Oh, yeah. You're wearing a shirt of your show that's explaining that it's now been around for 10 years. Right. And the movie came out when? The movie came out in 2010. And that's the inciting incident that sparked that, now a right. whole career. And that was the, yes, exactly. The big bang, if you will. But so, is the reason I think of it from what he's saying, which is like, the idea of staying on this journey and finding new things within it. Sure. Like, what has your experience with that been like? Well, the, the beautiful thing about my job is that it's different every time. Yes, the format of the show hasn't really changed, but the people on it change, the places we go are always different. 
we've been to some places a few times, but never the exact same place. Sure. You know, there's always a different hotel. There's always a different cafe. There's always an interesting, weird story or, or relationship that I'm dealing with. Yeah. Um, and I love it. I saw, um, I was watching, uh, I was uh, doing my research. Mm -hmm. I was watching an old interview you did, and it, you brought up something I hadn't really thought about, which is security. Like, you referenced, I think it was, uh, you, you, you were like, yeah. Oh, we, you mean like personally? Like, you no, know, you were like, we have a security right, guard, right. but like, you know, they wouldn't get there in time. Just, you're throwing yourself into very volatile situations where people, you're, you're basically, ca sometimes, sure, sure. catching people mid-deceit. Yeah, oh yeah. Are you ever worried about that? You know, it's funny. We actually just had a situation come up recently on an episode where we were helping, uh, uh, I don't know how old he was, probably late 20s, early 30s, really big guy. Just a big guy. Tall, wide, just big. And he thought he was talking to this girl. Turns out it was, there was a girl involved who he was hearing the voice of, but it was actually the, uh, it was really, the whole thing was orchestrated by his best friend and com comedy TikTok video partner oh. who happens to be a <laughs> shockingly small man. It was an elaborate prank on his friend for well, the purpose a of a TikTok video? No, well, that's what we thought it could be. Okay. But when I said, I just want, I want you to visualize the juxtaposition of a very, very large man. The, the movie Twins. Yeah, no, no, times 10. Oh. Because this is a guy, this is like a proper small person. Oh, okay, okay. Really small. <laughs> the big one was upset upon learning that his closest friend had been, had created this fake girl to try and cheer him up, but he didn't think it was funny because whatever. And he went for him. He like faked him out. He was like, all right, you got me. You got me really funny. And like went for like the funny friend handshake and then just picked him up off the ground and like started to try and grab him. And our security guard who was like a retired, not retired, but like a Vietnam vet yeah. who now does like, you know, private security, like was nowhere to be seen. I mean, he was hobbling. Through, I don't even know where he was, but like did not get there in the necessary amount so of time. So what do you do? Well, so we all kind of had to be like, whoa. But, yeah. It was fine, luckily. Put down the other man. Put down the guy, right? Yeah. But the reason that I'm less concerned than I think people tend to assume I would be is because most of the people who we help on the show, by nature of them being on Catfish, it's somewhat understood that they are passive, right? These are people who have chosen to be in relationships that are sort of resigned to their home, they're not aggressively looking for or pushing the envelope or forcing these people to be honest with them. They're mm. like, they're, they take what they can get. They're not aggressors. Right. You know what I mean? The operative premise dictates that. Right. It, yeah, okay. Interesting. I had to uh, catfish Hamilton to get him here today. <laughs> yeah. Well, you I don't cannot... entirely understand the right. lingo. Well, you know that now this, the, the name of his show became a definition, catfish. an if alternate you're, definition you're of the, the word. The concept of someone pretending to be someone else on the internet and that calling, mm. you call them a catfish. No, I did not know that. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, you... Yeah, um, that's the doctor right. we are talking about You before. sort of, unfortunately, got... Catfished? No. You... <laughs> you've almost become a catfish unintentionally because you've been Hamilton for so long, but now there's the show Hamilton, and I feel like, you, people, you know, you almost get misrepresented. So if they Google Hamilton, they're getting... I'm getting this. Yeah. Oh, I, really, I, I did want to ask how annoying Fake that news. is. How annoying That's that what is other it. people call it. How annoying is it the rise of that show for, like... Right, because your SEO yeah. is just Well, trash. actually, I used to, my whole <laughs> life, they say, what's your name? I say, Hamlet. They're like, Hamlet? Now it right, really right. is just kind of like, oh, your name's Hamilton. Okay. Yeah. Yes, that's kind of nice. Wait, what, where, what, why were you named Hamilton? Uh, it's like a family name. I'm not related to Alexander Hamilton. <laughs> I wasn't implying that. No, no, no. no I'm not. I don't know, some family name. R.I.P., you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Any nicknames? <laughs> Hamster. Ham, right? Hammer, ham, hammy. Any you prefer? You name it, I've heard it. Do you ham and cheese. Not good. Uh, People yeah. used to call me. We won't do that. Is there one you do? You, you ham, right? Depends ham. on who. I don't care. I like them all. Hammy. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> I like hammy. So yeah, but so now catfish is a new definition in the dictionary, right? Which is as a verb. Yes. Right. But so, you feel like the the premise of the show is broad enough that now it's constantly the gift that keeps on giving to you. Meaning the range of experience keeps broadening. Like, like the thing yes. I wanted to ask you yeah, is this yeah. though: what, like, what's the math now? What percentage over the decade is it like? Oh, like, like really, what percentage? Well, so are see, coming this, out okay? Right. Well, the problem is inherently, 
should you be in a relationship with someone who won't validate their identity <laughs> to the point where you need to bring them on the show Catfish, <laughs> it's not looking good. Right. Right. It's not, your odds are bad, right? Quite bad. So there are plenty of people who, who are in relationships that started on the internet. I just don't see those because that's they not, don't need They my don't help. need the outreach. Right, they don't, right. They, they're, they meet and go out on dates and are happy together. You grew up here. I grew up on the Upper West Side. And for me, growing up here, Brooklyn was very far away. Yeah. I'm embarrassed to say it, but like I never came to Brooklyn. And if I did, it was like I didn't know where I was. I was really lost. And I remember when I met and started dating my wife, she lived in Greenpoint. And I came to see her and I felt like I was in Europe. It was, I was so charmed. <laughs> I know, it's embarrassing. It's bohemian but, paradise. Yeah, I was like, wow, this is so cute. There's a bakery and like, look at these people. They know each other on the street and they're chatting in another language. This is amazing. It's, you know, it's Polish, obviously, but it just, it just <laughs> yeah. sounded like music to mm -hmm. me. And, um, and I'm still charmed, honestly, by, by Williamsburg. It's, it's great. It's got that old town vibe. The buildings are smaller. It's cute. Yeah. I even organize uh, neighborhood cleanups now because um, it's filthy. Well, uh, yeah. okay, yeah. I mean, New York City is disgusting. Right Number, my, tell, tell me if you're at, uh, on board with this at all. My two biggest pet peeves that also make me sound old are if I catch people littering or people honking their horn in the city. Okay, well, honking the horn I'm okay with. No, I have a new one that's going to be my new crusade, <laughs> which is um, motorcycles. I can't oh. fucking stand it. Wait, you mean okay, like the e-bike scooters? No, 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 motorcycles. The loud one. Well, actually, I got my oh, own oh. thing with that. Okay. But no, <laughs> I used to live on the corner of 95th and Columbus. I lived there for a long time, the Upper West Side. I know it well. Yeah. That Columbus Avenue is actually a very loud yes, street. Yes, it is. And the Ugh. buildings are big there, and they really right. reverberate. And so the big trucks go through. Mm -hmm. They're actually, they're loud, but they're not that loud. The motorcycles That's go terrible. through, and the fucking glass is shaking. So anyhow, like I live in Brooklyn now, and I actually have this dude across the street from me who repairs motorcycles out of his like living room. There's no charm to it. So they all pull up and they're like yeah. revving the engine uh, out front. Yeah. Right? So I'm always got dudes on the block coming up to get repaired and stuff like that. And it's just Oof. well, you're out to dinner with the kids or something. Somebody comes by on a motorcycle and they just rev it at a light. You know, it's so fucking loud. And I have like. You know, dude. I'm like half deaf. Yeah. Oh, I was gonna ask. And how, it's bothering how, me. How, how bad is your tinnitus? I have. Uh, I don't have. I don't have that. Actually. Your ears don't ring. No, but I do have. Uh, I went to a music festival and they were doing free. Um, oh, fuck. Free yeah, hearing, hearing tests. tests. Yeah, nice oh. one. So Skip the whole band one. got like the test, and they give you a chart at the end that shows you what you're missing and where it dips. And I had something called machine gunner's ear. In, in the <laughs> yeah, yeah. They were and like, they were you like, all. Yeah, I'm you're sorry, all great. Sorry. You got machine gunner's ear. And then, but then our sound man went in. The dude is in charge oh, of all the sound, and he brought out. <laughs> he like printed out his chart, and it was just like flat. <laughs> and he just stoned up. They were like, we're the like, band. <laughs> this dude is charge of our sound. Last ten years. Like four of you are good. One of you stormed the beach in Normandy, and the other's right. dead. Maybe he. Death. Maybe he feels the music. In, in his body, like, and he, that's how he... Yeah, or maybe knows. he sounded like shit. Right. <laughs> yeah. By the way, remember that wagon I drove you in? Yes. I've since... I, I loved it so much, I doubled down, and I got a second one. I have to show you another time. I would love to see yeah. it. Well, hang on. Speaking of wagons, the question I really want to ask both of you is, wow, should I have children? Oh, yeah. I was going to say, how many kids do you have? I have two. And you have? Three. And how do we feel about it, Hamilton? Don't do it. We can censor anything that's out. It's wonderful. <laughs> I can't imagine not. I would, it would be too depressing to not, in my mind. Right. Because the legacy mind. has to, the Lighthouser name has to live on. No, because I just like them. Oh. And I like spending time with them, and it's fun. It's like, a, it's like another project, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. How old are your kids? Uh, 11 and 8. How nice. about yourself? Six. Three and a half and one. Oh, so you're in the shit. <laughs> <laughs> I know what that's like. Um, no, I mean, basically, look, I have very, I, look, I wish you the best. Thank for you so show. much. Thank you so much. But is this going to be a <laughs> grand achievement for the rest of your life? Are you going to be a, clearly, the next maybe, talk clearly, to you? Yeah, perhaps, you perhaps. You know who's looking out? Is anybody tending bar over there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Get a, can we get another one? But I think even for me, having achieved a level of success in a specific <laughs> field, always looking out. I still feel like my <laughs> contribution to society is essentially not these humans. Well, no, right, right, outside of my children, and the idea that like 
they are a bigger, longer lasting legacy of some kind. That feels like something re like important. It's like wanna, a real accomplishment. Yeah, I, I, I want to be able to like show the secret of Nim to someone for the first time. That's like one of my biggest. Doing things with them for the first time is incredible. Right? It's fun. Yeah. During uh, like lockdown days. Oh yeah. He's doing these performances that are like live streamed from the backyard. He's singing, the children are all singing back up. It's this really beautiful thing. That's cool. I like, actually had a great sort of moment with my daughter recently. She's, she had her first loose tooth. So excited. Tied it to the That's doorknob? Exciting. Well, she yeah. wanted it out. I was like, just give it time and let it be loose. Right. She's like, no, I want to lose my tooth. I want the tooth fairy, like it has to be now. <laughs> and so I was like, well, if you want, I can try to get it out. And at first I thought, oh, I'll tie floss because I've seen that as a thing. Very difficult. Also because baby teeth are like sometimes pitched in, so like nothing. Wait, I was joking. You really wanted to do the? Well, I was gonna try that because I saw a funny video where the dad hooks the tooth up. Yeah, on it's like in the to, movie to The a Witch. Nerf gun, right? And yeah. then shoots the Nerf. Whatever. <laughs> so then I was just like, sorry, Cleo, I can't. I don't think it's gonna work. She's like, no, 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 get it out. So I went to my toolbox and I grabbed a pair of needle nose pliers. How do you feel about this, by the way, no, as a dad? And and I and I was okay. sure that she was gonna chicken out. I was like, there's no way. You really want me to use these and just like pull your tooth out? And she just, the most stoic, badass thing I've ever seen anyone do. She just sat there with her mouth open. Yeah. And I just grabbed on and I just went doink. And it was like, you know, I felt those. I, it was not like ready, ready. It was like she just fought it out. Didn't flinch. She was so excited and happy. That's it was incredible. Really cool. It was cool. I have a, a question for you. How does the nonstop travel of your show make you think, A, about the state of America, and B, about the state of New York City? I haven't noticed a huge change over my 10 years traveling the country, to be perfectly honest. Interesting. I find that wherever you go, I mean, look, I have the, the luxury of being a sort of known, mostly liked, Celeb, right? So, so when you arrive, it's with a nice right, red carpet I, right, feeling. Exactly. Yeah. I get I get, welcome I get treated nicer by default than I think most people do. But most everybody I've met in all my travels to every corner of the country, at, at every you know, economic level, is pretty similar. They're nice. They want the same basic stuff. They you know, they like their phones and, and they want to be able to watch their shows and eat food that they enjoy. I mean, like, they're, we're pretty basic. similar and basic, I think, in, in most of our desires and expectations. But dude, is that your experience of touring? Because I haven't toured since, I don't know, this seemingly market change. Like, certain mile markers I missed. Like, I stopped right. touring before 2016, so I'm curious. Right, right, right. Um, well, one thing that I noticed is that if you, what's really strange is that if you um, go uh, look, look at a map of, uh, you know, uh, counties that say Hillary Clinton won or something like that. And you look at the most conservative places that I play, uh, like Houston or Phoenix, I only play those counties. And downtown Houston went for Hillary Clinton. And downtown Phoenix went for Hillary Clinton. And the surrounding areas went for them right. too. But I'm not playing out where you see Oh, so you're Trump. not even seeing whatever we're talking so, about, right. To be honest, I've been to every single city in this country a lot. <laughs> yeah. And I still don't... You're not encountering that? Like, communicate with those people. Is that a drag? I don't know because I, it's just, I find it so strange. Because I would have said, well, I play for everybody. I mean, I, you know, I, I go to all the cities. Yeah. For me, just that's my only little insight into the... Uh, you know, divide. That you're going out there and you're still not accessing. I can go out and tell people to vote or whatever, but like, everyone I'm playing for the is- choir. I mean. Mm. Yeah. That's yeah. interesting. Have you met a, a like conspiracy theorists? Any of those people? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. You play for them? I mean, there's always somebody. There's always somebody. There's always somebody who wants to talk a lot. There's always somebody who wants to talk a lot. <laughs> Do you get cornered after shows a lot now? I mean, it depends, I, yeah, sometimes. Yeah. If you go out in the crowd, you always meet somebody who wants to. There's always the person who wants to talk the most is the person you really got to get away from. In my mind, that's me. I was that guy, probably to you. <laughs> hey, man. <laughs> like, no, we were buddies. Yeah, we did okay. Do you? You must get it all the time. Yeah, I get a lot of people who want to tell me their stories about 
a friend or a cousin or themselves kind of getting catfish. Anyway, and, and then in response to your question about New York City. Yeah. Uh, to me, New York City feels great. I mean, obviously I have some gripes. The, the number of dead rats on the street is insane. And I mean, we've got to get a special dead rat cleanup crew. I mean, like, the street sweepers aren't doing it because they're really, like, pancaked down. Like, we need a special You're worried about crew. dead rats more than living rats. I mean, I don't have to see the living rats all day long. I mean, I, I've, I've, be, I've named the rats on our street. We pass them every day. I think we need a committee. <laughs> you, you, in, you in on this? A dead rat committee. A dead rat? That would be the uh, D Disney, DSNY, right. Department of Sanitation New York. Right. Yeah. Well, they, we're Literally the, impossible we're gonna the URL. to contact them. I you actually have Wait, will you try to? Why? Why have I tried? You don't want to get into that. <laughs> okay. Well, my, I'm a homeowner here. You just uh, uh, my yeah. stories. I, I, I if I start talking, I won't stop talking about that. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. We won't, we won't yeah, make yeah, you don't do go that. There. That's not the fun side. That's not. No. The, okay. That's not on camera. That's no. where I change. That's oh yeah. Right. Oh that's yeah. That's where you become your real selves when you talk about the Department of Sanitation. And I do not talk about the Department of Sanitation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I actually, I, well, I'm like a, I'm one of the types of people that when I move into a building and subsequently the neighborhood, I really sink my teeth in. You know, I, I get involved. Yeah, this, this is unlocking territories I never knew the show would go to. And so one of the things that bothered me was for, for like the last year and a half, there's been an abandoned car on the corner of our block. And... In Williamsburg? Yeah. Yeah, that's odd. No, I know. It was like an old cab that had been painted black and... It's an art installation. It had a fake plate, plate on the back. Not fake, but like an, a trailer from some other state. And I was like... So I, you know, I went on the website, I filled out a complaint, then I called, and, I, and they're like, oh, well, if it has a plate on it, we can't do it. So I had to take the plate off, and then if someone came and weirdly put another plate on it, and then I... Wait, and, you mean you had to steal the plate? No, I didn't steal it, I just took it off. Why don't they have to the move for street cleaning? It wouldn't move. That was the problem. It was just collecting garbage but around But they never it towed it? They would no. No one came to do anything. Mm. Anyway, this is not interesting. But <laughs> this is the most interesting thing. But I, 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 I eventually, eventually, I cracked through, and I, and one day it was gone, and I, and and it really. This is all you. Th now I know what you really think about. I imagine you think about music I love this and shit. art I love little, and film. You think about yeah. the Department of Sanitation. That's what I'm thinking about. The DOB. That's where I don't go. I don't. Right. That's what I really. DOB. We got a lot to talk about. What? Well, you, I, I, no, it's the whole fucking you know thing. No, no, the no. Sorry, the opposite. I got problems. You just got me all hopped up. Wow. No, the DOB. Is <laughs> That's getting hot. But I do in here. know people at the San at Department of Sanitation. You do. Mm -hmm. Wait, what? I've become friendly with this with a guy who works at the Sanitation Foundation, which is the not for profit wing of the Department of Sanitation. Mm. Not for profit wing. They, it turns out. <laughs> Turns out there is a whole organization that does like community related events and they have the fashion show. They have like a, a reused they have a fashion fabric show. fashion show. They do like the composting, is that them? They, they I think that maybe that might yeah. be them also. There's I'm actually an event coming up that I just got invited to. I, I have to look at it, but. Well, in, well, can we get invited? You guys want to come? I mean, to Hamilton? <laughs> no thanks. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> I might come. Okay. Okay. Um, I mean, I guess that wraps it up. Uh, thank you for uh, joining uh, Daytime with the Department of Sanitation. And, um, you know, uh, I guess we'll uh, be seeing you all soon. <laughs> thank you so much for oh, coming. Sure. Thank you. Thanks for having me, man. Give me. Well, I was going to, I thought. Oh, we in? Go. Well, it went in front in, of do me. It, so do, it, do, it, do it, do it, do it, do it. Do it. On three, say sanitation, One. litter, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> 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 Woo. All righty. All right, this is uh, my song in a blackout. I live in a nameless town. No need to wander around. I live in a nameless town. A blackout. Many friends have said goodbye Paraded out in one proud life I say they all just lost their mind Blackout 
We'll wait for the year when the tide comes rolling over the rails. From me to the end of the island. Walk When you come home, I lift you up, and there's only the two of us in a black and now you're sleeping in the back of a speeding out cab. You throw a kiss. Thank you. Yeah. Well, that's the first time I've ever heard that. <laughs>